Hangin'. Welcome to Hangin' at the Hangar Bar. I'm Scott. I'm Candace. I'm Lariah. And I'm Lacey. Grab a drink and come hang with us at the Hangar Bar. Hey everyone, welcome back to Hangin' at the Hangar Bar. We are super glad that you are here with us today. And tonight we are actually doing the second quarter book for the Hanging at the Hanger Bar book club. We will be talking about this fine book here, Dream It, Do It. Um, it is writ- was written by none other than the fabulous Marty Sklar, who if you are any kind of Disney file at all, his name should ring hundreds of bells for you. It was Sklartastic. Oh dear. <laughs> well, that was a choice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Scott, what was your overall impression of the book? I really enjoyed it. Much like the first one, this felt very much like a business book. And there's things that I took from this one that I almost immediately applied to my job. Would you share some of that with us? Yeah, I sure can. I think a little bit of background. In my day job, I work in kind of a creative field. It's not imagineering creative, but it's that kind of, of work. I work in a in a department that's a learning and development organization and we design training, we deliver training, all of those kind of things my my group does. And as we build out our training, a lot of it comes down to creative mind versus business mind. And in this book, Mr. Scalar talks a lot about that in terms of how they set up Imagineering with him is that kind of creative brain and somebody else is a business brain. And some of the things that he said he did when he set up the Imagineering organization, I'm already starting to look to potentially apply to my organization at at work. But there was one anecdote that I gave to my team. One of the things that he talked about in the book, and I'm just going to read exactly what I told my team, because I, I think the way I phrased it sort of pulled in from the book itself. But I titled the post, No Because versus yes if which was something that Mr. Sklar brought up a couple times in in the book that we read for this book club and it's such a powerful philosophy so what i told my team is i am reading a book by someone who led Walt Disney Imagineering for over 30 years his name was Marty Sklar he was telling a story that caught my attention when talking about approaching Walt with ideas Walt hated the word no and people knew that they couldn't tell him no And the phrase no because was even worse because Walt thought it limited progress and ingenuity within the Disney company. Instead, folks learned that when Walt asked for something, you always had to respond, yes, if. And I absolutely love that. We all know there's going to be barriers in what we do. What do we need to be able to do in order to be able to say go, in order to say yes? Everything is possible if we have the right resources, tools, et cetera. And I said, I just thought I would share something that struck close for me. And that one kind of, as as I read through that book, continued to be something that resonated in my mind is that yes, if. Oftentimes we get into that place of I'm too busy, I'm too stuck, there's too many barriers. So no, because of all these reasons versus yes, I can accomplish this if this, this, and this happened is a much different conversation than no, because there's a hundred things that are going to get in my way. I absolutely loved that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Marty actually mentioned several times in the book that he learned very quickly when working with Walt that no was not an option. Right. And it, it, you just don't tell Walt Disney no. That was a good way to not work for Walt Disney anymore. Exactly. Well, I mean, look at look at all the the hubbub that uh, surrounded his discussions with P.L. Travers about the whole Mary Poppins story and how many times she told him no. Right. And he just kept going. Yes. (laughs) I'm going to do it anyway. So you might as well tell me yes. Right. Well, and the thing about it is, is like telling him no was almost like a challenge. Be like, okay, I'm just going to ask you again. Right. So what's one thing that you looking back on the book kind of took away from it as a as a key takeaway? I think a lot of the same philosophies of 
figuring out things because you have to and making it the very best that it can be and not just settling for something less than what it should be. Right. Do you recall any examples of him talking about where that showed up in the Imagineering world? I think he spoke a lot of it when he was talking about finding the sponsorships for Epcot and how they would go to these huge companies and sit down with their CEOs and say, this is what we want to do. We want you to be a part of it because of X, Y, Z. And oh, by the way, if you don't, we've got this competitor of yours in our back pocket, whether or not they really did. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just like this, this is what we want. And I, I can't remember the specific examples, but there were quite a few in here where they were actually having discussions with other Imagineers saying, no, this isn't what we agreed to. It's not what we want. It's not going to be the right thing for us. So we're not going to do it. Yeah. And as you were talking about the sponsorships for Epcot, one of the stories that he told popped into my brain that I, I thought was absolutely a phenomenal story. And I don't remember who they were presenting to. Maybe it was the CEO of GM at the time. I think that's right. But the first time they met with him, they they set, they got in the night before, they set up all of their storyboards, they did all of the things getting ready for the presentation, only to find out that the CEO liked to sit at the head of the table. And they had the room set up to be where the CEO would be sitting in the middle of the table to where he could see everything. And they walked out without a deal because the CEO was sitting so far away from everything even passed a note that said, who are these people? Right. And then the next time that they got to present for this same CEO, they went back and they set it up in the exact same way. But when the the VPs or whoever came in and reminded them that the CEO liked to sit at the head of the table, Marty looked at them and said, I'd, I'm going to present to whoever's sitting in that seat right there. If he wants to sit at the head of the table and just watch me to present to somebody else, that's great. But this this person's going to get the show of a lifetime and they're yeah. going to know exactly what's happening with our proposal. And you know what? The CEO came in and the vice president said, "Disney, the, the folks from Disney would like you to sit in this chair. And he sat in that chair, didn't complain, didn't say anything. And then they walked out with a deal because they were presenting to the right person in the right chair. Nobody had ever asked that CEO to modify his behavior before. Nobody bothered to ask if he would mind sitting in another in another seat. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of imaginative thinking and sort of stick to itiveness that I think you have to have if you want to be an Imagineer, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, you have to be creative. And so if you run into those roadblocks of, no, we can't do this, this can't be done because of all of these op obstacles, there's always a way to do something. Yeah. Okay. Always. Saying something can't be done, it's kind of a fallacy because 99.9% .9 of the time there is a way to do it. You just have to be creative enough to think through it and make it as beneficial for all involved as possible. Yep. Agreed. I think that's such powerful messaging throughout. But if you think about it, I mean, that's, that's the Disney thing. Yeah. It's like, if, if we don't have a certain technology that we need to tell a certain story, we're going to invent it because we can. Right. We need it. So we have to build it. Right. Because it doesn't exist or it's too expensive or it's not environmentally friendly as we wish to be aka the fire uh, fireworks on the cruise ships right all these things and yeah it it's just and that that i think is part of one of my reasons that i love the disney company so much is because they're willing to do those things where and chart territories that aren't otherwise charted mm -hmm. what are some things that maybe surprised you in the book so i noticed in this book as well as the one that we read for first quarter that when you hear these people that have worked in Imagineering and really what that means to the world and the history of the Disney company and how huge something like that actually is, how just everyday commonplace, whatever these stories seem to be it's like oh yeah i was having lunch with john hench or oh yeah i had coffee with mary blair what the hell 
<laughs> right. <laughs> like, no. And you get to work with these people every day, these brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people that are at this stage of the game, stuff of legend. And you just worked with them every day and hung out with them on weekends, maybe, and took a couple scouting trips when we were trying to open different areas of the parks with them and didn't want to hang out with Roy um, Disney and his wife. But yeah, Marty and Leah sure did. Yeah, sitting on a plane with Roy and what was Roy's wife's name? I don't know. I can't remember. I can't remember either. Sorry, Roy. Sorry, Roy. That, but yeah, I, I think that one was like the thought process of of what happens in Imagineering. The other, the thing that surprised me more is Walt Disney Imagineering is such what I would consider to be a household name now. It's mm-hmm. synonymous with the Disney company. Yes. It, when it was started, though, just like in any business, they really don't know where to put it. They've, right. they've tried to put it in operations. They've tried to put it in creative. They've tried to put it on its own. They've tried so many different things because they don't know what to do with it. And one of the things is, as Marty was talking about that in the book, one of the things that caught me as odd is the CEO after Roy had walked into the Imagineering offices what did he say? Exactly three times. Mm-hmm. There were people, it, it, the The Imagineering building was three miles away from the main studio. And there were high ups in the company that would get lost trying to get to the Imagineering studio. It's only three miles away and you're getting lost mm-hmm. because you think it's that much of a throwaway. Mm-hmm. And there's the operations people trying to to operationalize everything and forget that the creative side has to exist differently than the operation side and that's another thing that i again i work in a creative field i feel that every day that mm-hmm. everything comes down to the operational side of it and that hamstrings really what you can do and how effective you can be from a creativity standpoint and that is one of the things that surprised me like we talked about that in first quarter too the number of things where it where you know disney's a company right we put it on such a pedestal that mm-hmm. you forget that it's it's simply a Fortune 50 company or a Fortune 100 company that's out there trying to do the best it can, just like every other company. Mm-hmm. And like to hear people talk about that that kind of consternation in the day to day, it 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 always shocks me because of how high you put Disney because of what they've been able to accomplish in a hundred years. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and when you think about the fact that they have stockholders that they have to report to, they have budgets that they have to report to, they have a board of directors they have to report to. They have all those things that they have to keep in mind as well as guest experience. And yeah, it's easy to say, oh, we'll spend a gajillion dollars to build this stupid thing. Because our beloved fans say that they want to have this sort of experience. But, oh, wait, we can't spend a gajillion dollars because, A, it's not in the budget. B, it doesn't make sense. And C, no. Right. No matter how many yes ifs you give, sometimes the Roy Disney's of the world say no. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have to win, unfortunately. Yeah. The other thing that kind of caught me by surprise is how cyclical things really are in the Disney universe. Mm -hmm. Like if you've listened to our podcast at all, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot is how sometimes you feel like they're missing the magic they're missing the mark with the magic a little bit. They're not taking care of things as well as they should. They're mm-hmm. not putting fresh coats of paint on the things that they should put fresh coats of paint on. And it was it, it made me laugh because pre-Michael Eisner, the parks went through a a phase of 
being like Disneyland went through a phase of being run down, like rotting wood, scratched off paint. And this was not all that long ago. Well, it was a long time ago. It was in the late 70s. No, it was post when I went as a kid. So it would have been late 80s into the early 90s before Eisner came that the parks went through a we just don't care about them. That's not where our, our money is made. That's not, they're going to come anyway. So why why dump a lot of money into it kind of philosophy? And, and it feels like we're kind of back there again. Like that's what Chapik tried to do a little bit of, of let's, let's pull back and they're going to come anyway. So why not charge them more and take care of less? In your little diatribe that you just had you mentioned two of my least favorite people in this entire empire how dare you sir right and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about are you ready to move into my my kind of challenge question for you from this book i am okay michael eisner saved disney literally saved the company that was very evident in this book that Disney was going down a bad path and Eisner and Frank Wells came in and made Disney kind of what it is today, expanded from Disneyland and Disney World and Epcot into the four parks and all the hotels we we know and love in Florida, built California Adventure that became a better version of California Adventure. Tokyo Disneyland, Tokyo Disney Sea, Hong Kong Disney, all of those parks would not exist if it were not for Michael Eisner. Tell me why, well, first off, did this book at all change your perception or disdain for Michael Eisner? It gave me a little more perspective, and I will admit a little more appreciation for what he actually did for the company. I don't necessarily think that without Frank Wells, a lot of it would have happened because I think Eisner was the ego behind the whole thing and Frank Wells made it happen. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the whole, I can't even say it. I cannot even draw this parallel. You got to now that you put it out there. No, I really don't. I can't. <laughs> but now I'm curious and I don't think I can move on. <laughs> no, I can't. Damn it, Candace. <laughs> <laughs> if you think I had a stroke over calling the or changing the castle back into a cake, this would cause a massive stroke right here now. And you almost gave it to yourself. I almost did. I'm telling <laughs> you like that. <laughs> That's too funny. And I, I tend to agree. I think Eisner and Frank Wells as a team were a fantastic thing for Disney at the time when it was needed. But I, I think as with any CEO, they run their course, right? Like eventually they get to a spot where I've done all I can do. And what I think I appreciate most about what Eisner did is he let the creatives be creative. He would drop in and say, hey, what about this? And let them do it. And that's a very Walt thing, if you think about it. Let's drop into a room of smart people and say, let's try this and see what happens. It is, but my problem with Michael Eisner has always been that he was very seriously pressuring the powers that be to get rid of animation. Yes. Do you remember why? No, and I really don't care. <laughs> because that's where Walt got his start. That's what started this whole thing. Yeah. And as I've talked about before, you have to remember where you've come from and you have to honor that. Yeah, rem and Walt even yeah. said it. You remember this, this all started with a mouse. That's right. And and to get rid of something like that and just call it a bunch of amusement parks. Well, hello, Six Flags. Right. So what if I read between the lines, right, I I, I need to dig into this a little bit more because I, I probably am going to speak a little bit out of turn. I think you're right in that he wanted to get rid of the department called Walt Disney Animation. But I think the reason why he was doing that was very future focused. Because he was, let's buy Pixar. All of the animation is now being done via computers. And there's going to be less of a market for hand-drawn animation. 
So I think he was trying to be very future focused. It may have been the wrong decision. He's a human. He can make a wrong decision, right? But that doesn't yeah. take away, in my mind, all the greatness that he did for that company. Well, okay. <laughs> you disagree. I, I've said my piece and I have my opinion of Michael Eisner, just like I have my opinion of Bob Chapik. Yeah, Michael Eisner, for me, like, and I know this book wasn't about Michael Eisner. There was, what, three chapters that were dedicated to him. But my opinion of Michael Eisner, the more I read about how he was able to turn Disney around, fend off, basically having the company be broken up. You talk about Walt Disney animation going away. That almost happened. That would have been spun off to some other universal type program or, or something like that. And, and part of that. And so the fact that he was able to save that, the more I learn about how he ran the company until the last year or two, again, when Frank Wells died, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to be said for the way he ran the company, the way they ran the company. But Chapik is one, the more I learn about what he was doing and how he led the company, that's one where I go back and admit I'm wrong. There's not very many rede redeeming qualities about his time as CEO. And I've been saying this for how long? And you argue with me all the time. Well, because again, I try and stay grounded in the, it's a business. They have to run a business. But this book actually kind of pointed out that, you know what, let's make the business and the creative be on equal footing. That's what Roy and Walt had. Mm -hmm. That's what Eisner and Wells had. Mm -hmm. That's what Marty, and I can't remember his cohort in Imagineering had. One kind of ran the business. One was the creative piece of it. Mm -hmm. And that, like, in that type of business, you need that more and more. And I think... Chapik lost sight of that. He he was an operations person and kind of gave up on the creative. Every, when everything becomes dollars and cents, you lose all sense of creativity. I don't really know that he's a creative soul. I mean, and then that, and again, that's not any, well, it is because I don't like him. But coming from a accounting background, and having to live dollars and cents, dollars and cents, dollars and cents, dollars and cents, that doesn't scream creativity. Right. You can't be creative with dollars and cents without going to prison. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with Disney is whoever is leading Disney has to remember that creative has to be on equal footing with the operations. Yes. And I also thought it was funny that and there was a very small snippet of mention of the CEO that uh, came right after Eisner. And he was there for a very, very, very short time. But to me, it sounded like sort of the first round of Chapik. Right. Where it was all dollars and cents and he didn't have any of the creative interest, maybe. Is that what right. I'm looking for? Like, yeah. we don't need it because we can build this stuff and we'll spend the money as little as possible. And the people will flock to us anyway, because we are who we are. Well, no, that's not how this works. Right. You got to keep fighting for your audience. Absolutely. For Walt would audience. not have been pleased right. at all. Yeah. Agreed a hundred percent. And that is, this book was very good for me in that it centered me back into that putting creative on the, the same level as the operation side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important, especially for a business like Disney. If you move away from the creative, you're you're digging your grave. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do they do best? They tell stories. Right. It's hard to tell stories with graphs and numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. You can probably do it if you animate it properly. But and it's not the type of story that we're talking about with Disney. No, which not is at all. Which is exactly why... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted. They could make it happen. I don't know that if you were to put a, an Excel spreadsheet in front of the non-business people at Imagineering, that they could do anything creative with it. They'd probably figure out a way to color in the cells to make it turn into Mickey Mouse. But <laughs> well, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> good voice talent, good animation. It's all right. there. Yeah. It won't, be it won't be useful as a tool for business anymore, but it'll be really cool to look at. Absolutely. <laughs> 
There it is for 2024. You heard it here first, folks. Disney Pixar proudly presents Excel, the movie. <laughs> oh, goodness. I want to see that movie. It'd be something to sleep through. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is too funny. Okay. What else? I don't know. I, I will say that I really, really, really enjoyed the book and I loved marty's approach to telling the stories that he had to tell like it was very much a memoir but you could tell that he loved sharing those stories and like the amount of entitlement that he had to be patting himself on the back but he didn't like he seemed like a very humble guy through through this whole thing yeah like he didn't quite understand the magnitude of what it was that he was helping put together I would agree with that. There were times I felt it was, how do I want to say this? There were times I felt when he was a little, I'm trying to use a big word and the and it's not the right word. So I'm trying to think of now the, the little word. I think it was a little self-serving in places, but I think that's true of any memoir. A little braggadocious maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, there were a couple of times, especially in the beginning when he was talking about all the things that, that he wrote that Walt said. Mm-hmm. Which, number one, now when I look at anything that Walt said, I'm going to be like, oh, my God, Marty probably wrote that. <laughs> but it it like for somebody that throughout the book preached that there's no there's only one name on the door. Yep. There was a lot of I did this and I did this and I did this, which, again, it's a memoir. So you expect some of that. It's this probably wasn't written for me. It was more written for his kids. And mm -hmm. the people that he worked with that knew him and knew what he was doing. But I, I agree with you 100%. Most of it was very much, I got the sense throughout that as it was happening, he didn't know how how big of a deal what he was creating or helping create really was. Yeah. And, and the lasting impact that he would have. I mean, so the Disney company has a honor that they give called Disney Legend. And so like if we're watching something on Disney Plus or or any of those types of things and you see like somebody's name in a caption at the bottom of the screen and it says Disney legend, they're not just blowing smoke. Like that is a thing. And everyone should aspire to be a Disney legend. But in order to be a Disney legend, you have to work for the Disney company. Hello. <laughs> um, so Marty was a Disney legend. Like he was presented that award. And then he also has a window on Main Street USA. Yes. What does his window say? I don't know. It's in the picture section of the book. I'm getting there. Hold the phone. Hold please. The other thing that I want you to look up while you're looking up for what his window says is when he was talking about the people that on his retirement sent him notes. I want an exact quote of the one about the Haunted Mansion. Okay, so his Main Street USA window is actually at Disneyland. And it says, Main Street College of Arts and Sciences, established 1852, Martin A. Sklar, Dean. Inspiring dreamers and doers of tomorrow. That's amazing. I know. So another Easter egg to look for when we go to Disneyland. Spend right. half a day just staring up at the windows. Which I don't think is wrong. <laughs> no, that's why they're there. That anyway. A again, you think about that level of detail in the windows above that 80% of people probably never look at. That's the Disney difference. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to Six Flags or Universal. Yeah. <laughs> and so Candace is looking for a quote right now in the book. He went through and shared several messages from people when he retired and one of them was about his window that he got on Main Street. And it's better than better than being a part of another attraction. And I thought it was a hilarious quote. And I, after Candace finds it, I will tell you what my first thought was. Oh, it's a window on Main Street beats a tombstone at the Haunted Mansion. Yes, that's it. It still just makes me laugh. A window on Main Street beats a tombstone at Haunted Mansion. And my first thought when I read that, I turned to Candace and I said, I think I'd prefer a tombstone in Haunted Mansion. <laughs> just, I, I can't, if you're going to be a part of an attraction, 
that would be an amazing one to be a part of and being memorialized, having your tombstone as part of Haunted Mansion would be amazing. Yeah. The, o- the only thing I will say about that is that most of those to- tombstones are jokes in some way. They're not really honoring that. I mean, they are because you've got Master Gracie and, and those other people, but a lot of them are jokes. Which, you know, that's probably why that's a little bit of a compliment that rather right. a, a window on Main Street than be a joke in Haunted Mansion. I right. see. This is why we talk about these things, Candace, because I, I didn't catch that until right this moment. Yep. Good thinking. What I do. That's what you do. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to chat about. We talked about the CEO who you don't want to be named. The second CEO that you don't want to be named. Oh, we may have to dig into this sometime in one of our future book clubs, because I think there's probably books out there about it. But are you interested at all in the kind of drama, family drama that happened right before Eisner came and Walt's son-in-law was ousted as CEO? You know, no. No? Why not? We'll we'll probably come across it eventually, but it's not something that I want to spend time like actively searching for. Mm. If it happens to be part of a conversation or part of a book or something like that, fine. But no. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting that un- Uncle Roy or, or Uncle Roy's kids are the ones that a- were better able to bring Walt's vision along. Mm-hmm. Than Walt's own kid, Diane, and her husband. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's an interesting one. Okay, I think that's it that I wanted to chat about. Anything else that you want to chat about in this book? Um, I don't think so. I would recommend it for any Disney fan Dis- or think. Imagineering fan out there. Just it, it, it was a read. I mean, it's 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 a little bit chunky, but. It's a good book. It's a good story. Um, Marty does a beautiful job of sort of telling about his life in very, it was very matter of fact, but it was very like entertaining all at the same time. Yeah. And for being a, what, 380 page book, it's yeah. a quick read. I I think I finished it. We joked a couple weeks ago at book or at our, when we were recording that I needed to get started on the book. And that was not a a lie I had not started reading it yet and I was able to finish it in just over a week and I'm not a very strong reader it usually takes me a little bit longer to read and comprehend but this one I I was able to read fairly quickly and and it lots of it stuck with me so definitely highly recommend this one it's a good book and yeah yeah it moved itself along quite nicely I thought and yet it's shared the details that needed to be shared yeah. Oh, one more thing, and then we'll introduce the book club for third third quarter. Okay. The the other thing that just kind of blew me away, that kind of tugged at my heartstrings, is there was a moment in the book when Marty was talking about the scholarship that he set up and the fact that there's only two things you can do with a piece of paper. You can either be scared of the fact that there's nothingness and there's no direction, or you can be excited about all the possibilities when you get a blank sheet of paper in front of you. And he always encouraged people to do um, do the best they could with that blank sheet of paper and, and use their imagination. And then in the book, he left a page blank and said, here's a page for you to start your thoughts on. Go out and become an Imagineer. Right. I just, I don't know why that hit me. But it's like, oh, that's amazing that he that like that little thing, just that one blank sheet of paper in a book that he's like, don't be scared of this. Do something with it. Yep. Was amazing. Yep. Okay. So, Candace, what is our third quarter book? So our third quarter book is called The Sorcerer's Brother. How Roy O. Disney Made Walt's Magic Possible. It is by Scott M. Madden. And it's not, it's not very thick, but the the it's 214 pages long. This much of it is notes. Um, it's 168 pages long. Okay. So I think it'll be really interesting. 
Yeah, should be a good one. I, I'm always interested in in the dynamic between Walt and Roy. And like we were talking about earlier in this episode, the ability for Roy to keep Walt in check and the ability for Walt to bring Roy along for some of the adventures was like their dynamic. And you know they're brothers, but that brothers don't always work that well together. But yeah, especially they, when there's an age difference like there was. Yeah, but they they figured it out and built one of the greatest things this world has ever seen. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for that one, too. Yay. And we hope you all join in reading. Um, Again, this is just once a quarter, so there's not a big tax on time. I know we're all busy, but um, if you want to dive deep into the the history of Disney and and all of that and maybe get some new perspectives on the company and kind of where it's been and where it's headed, um, we would very much love to have you join us. Yeah, for sure. And then join us for the conversation. We want your opinion too. If you've always dreamed about being a part of a podcast, this would be your opportunity to just dip your big toe in the water just a little bit and join us for a a fun conversation. Yep. So we will be discussing the Sorcerer's Brother at the end of September. And then at that point, we will announce our final book for 2023 and kind of decide if we want to move on beyond that. Perfect. That sounds great. And friends of the Hangar Bar, remember, there is a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And we'll see you real soon.